This week on the post-WrestleMania edition of Not Sam Wrestling, we've got Vicky Guerrero on the show, plus breaking down everything that was last weekend, what came off of last weekend, and everything to come a day late, but not a buck short. This is Not Sam Wrestling. This is Not Sam Wrestling. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Oh man, what a week it's been. Thank you for being patient. I appreciate all you guys being patient. Welcome to Not Sam Wrestling. I don't believe that a week has gone by in the last, uh, how many weeks has it been now? In the last 233 weeks, I don't think a week has gone by that we haven't had Not Sam Wrestling. It's a little late this week, but it's still here. Don't you worry about it. It will be here. Here it is. Not Sam Wrestling coming off of WrestleMania weekend. And I will tell you, it's been a very busy, very, very busy week for me. It was one of those weeks where, uh, you know, I feel like, first of all, you know, a lot of times with these WWE weekends, I have so much respect and so much credit is due to the, the, the cast and the crew of the WWE, the crew especially, because the crew is the one putting in, I mean, 18-hour workdays every day, every day that this is happening. You know, you have to understand, WWE comes into town, WrestleMania is their biggest show of the year. Everybody is in WrestleMania mode, has been in WrestleMania mode for months. Tensions are at at an all-time high. Stress levels are at an all-time high. There is more to do than any other point in the year. And you sit there, and you have all the media leading up. You've got access. You've then got NXT TakeOver. You've then got Hall of Fame. You've then got WrestleMania. You've then got Raw. You've then got SmackDown. You finally get to Wednesday morning and you realize there's no way. I got to figure out what we're doing on Monday. But still, somehow, and by the way, for some of the WWE crew, then they go to Orlando on Wednesday to do a bunch of NXT TV tapings. So then you get all the way to Thursday and people got to figure out what's going on on Monday. The the uh, the opening day, the off season of the WWE. I was figuring this out because opening day for WWE is the Raw after WrestleMania. As WrestleManias have gotten later as the years have gone by, and this year was absolutely no exception. I think it might have been the longest WrestleMania of all time. So this year's WrestleMania ends at about twelve thirty a.m. Monday Night Raw starts at eight p.m. So in terms of on air, and you know that all of those hours that I just mentioned, from 12.30 a.m. to 8 p.m., there is somebody working on the WWE product. Some of those hours, a lot of people are working. In every hour, there's somebody working on the WWE product. That's the off-season. 12.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Monday, Eastern Standard Time, is the WWE's off-season because Monday, the new season begins. I mean... You know, I did uh, NXT TakeOver on Friday. I went to the Hall of Fame on Saturday simply as a guest with my wonderful wife. And then on Sunday, I did the WrestleMania kickoff show, which, I mean, the full two hours, it was a dream come true with Coach and Edge and Christian and Booker T and David Otunga and Shawn Michaels and Jerry Lawler and JBL and Paige and everybody. I mean, it was just, it's an amazing, amazing thing to be a part of. But I get home. You know, Monday afternoon, so I I did WrestleMania. I went to, and and by the time we got back to the hotel, thank God we didn't have to wait through the delays that some of the uh, uh, WWE fans, the members of the WWE universe, had to wait through. Apparently there were people who were outside of MetLife Stadium until like 3 o'clock in the morning or later. I don't know how. I guess it's just because, and this is how you know it was a good show. I guess it's just because people were feeling good and they had that WrestleMania... uh, that that uh, WrestleMania spirit, the way people get Christmas spirit, wrestling fans get WrestleMania spirit. They had that WrestleMania spirit in them because somehow there were no fights. There was no nothing. It was just people sitting there in the rain, 3.30 in the morning, waiting to get an Uber or to get on a train to get out of MetLife Stadium and back into society so they could go to their jobs or schools or whatever it is the next morning. A lot of people obviously on vacation, but there were also a lot of people that have to go to work on Monday morning. And it was all worth it to them. 
I did see that the New Jersey Transit Authority, the MTA of New Jersey, were blaming WWE, saying that the reason that they didn't have uh, as many trains as they thought they were going to was that it was union issues because the WWE didn't inform them that they were going to go until 12.30 a.m. That they, and at, at midnight or whatever time, after a certain number of hours, you have to, uh, you can't ask people to work anymore. You have to wait for the next group of staffing to come in, and that takes time. They said they thought WrestleMania was going to be over at 10.30 p.m. WWE led them astray. Do they not have the WWE Network? In the history of WrestleMania, when has WrestleMania ever been over at 10.30 p.m.? There is simply no way, and I have no idea. I'm so far removed from all of this, but in my opinion as a fan, realistically, there's no way that WWE would have told anybody associated with anything that they'd be done with WrestleMania by 10.30 p.m.? At no point, can you imagine, for everybody that complains about how long the show is, if WrestleMania was three and a half hours, if the show started at seven, you know, not counting the pre-show, if the show started at seven and ended at 10.30, you'd be going home like, what the hell was that? I thought it was WrestleMania, 10.30. I understand 12.30 is late, but New Jersey came across, I think, looking uh, very, very bad towards the end there. Everything else was great. Uh, everybody in the buildings was great. Uh, security actually got everybody in. I've been to WrestleManias and stadiums where it takes two hours just to get in the building, but not at MetLife. Everybody got in. Everybody was comfortable. The fact that everybody was in a good mood leaving lets you know that the people who were staffing the buildings were all doing a hell of a job. It's just the uh, the public transportation systems. And I'm, New Jersey's not alone. New York is a mess. Everywhere's a mess. It's a tough thing to do, I suppose. Uh, but so I get home, right? I go back to the hotel in Brooklyn. Uh, after WrestleMania, by the time we get home, it's about 1.30 in the morning. Because even with, you know, a police escorted uh, shuttle back to the hotel, it's still 45 minutes to get back to Brooklyn from New Jersey. But we get back to the hotel in Brooklyn. Um, everybody's still buzzing. I'm still buzzing about WrestleMania. So I head down to the after party for, you know, a good hour, hour and change a little bit. And I was surprised. Everybody was, I mean, a lot of people were there. Not everybody, but a lot of people were there. And a lot of times when WrestleMania goes really late, everybody's exhausted. They just go to bed. But a lot of people showed up to the after party, which, again, lets you know that there's a good faith happening, I believe. Morale is uh, high for, or I guess so. I mean, look, morale's high for me. I had a time of my life. I guess I shouldn't be speaking for everybody. But the fact that they go to the party would lead me to believe that they're not miserable, right? So then I, I sleep for an hour and a half, wake up in the hotel in Brooklyn, jump on the subway, get to work at Sirius XM there in Manhattan, do the radio show with James Norton, leave the radio show, go back to the hotel, pack up my bags, go home. I'm home Monday afternoon by like, you know, whatever, 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the afternoon. I'm sitting there, I'm watching Raw, go to sleep, wake up, go to work, come home, back to the normal routine. By the time I'm watching SmackDown, you get to the, this place where WrestleMania feels like a lifetime ago. You know, like there is so much in the moment. Like, oh my God, if I could just tell you the feelings that I was feeling throughout the entire two hours, you know, the, just the the tension. And that's just me on the kickoff show. I can't imagine how the men and women who perform in that ring are feeling leading up to it. But just like the huge weight that is off my shoulders once the kickoff show is over, and I think that it goes considerably well, um, that, you know, emotionally you're just spent. So... The fact that 36 hours goes by, it's like I'm I'm sitting there watching SmackDown going, WrestleMania was a lifetime ago, and I'm back to life kind of, you know, doing my normal thing. And I have these thoughts as I'm listening to Corey Graves do commentary and Becky Lynch come out and do a promo and, and everything going on. I start looking at the cameramen. And I start looking at the producers, the line producers that are running around and the people backstage. And I start thinking about the lighting guys. And I start thinking about everybody backstage, the graphics people. I start thinking about the people in the in the TV trucks. And I'm going, oh my God, they're still at it. I was exhausted come Monday. Monday afternoon, I was spent. These guys are still at it 36 hours later, nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. So kudos to everybody there. But then I go, okay, Wednesday, I'll, uh, by the time Wednesday rolls up, I'll be back to normal, right down into the Not Sam studio 
to do Not Sam Wrestling. You know, it's an exciting time. Uh, the studio is a bit of a mess because I've been doing a whole bunch of unboxing videos that I've been putting at patreon.com slash not Sam wrestling, except when I do unboxing videos, obviously I open up the packages of the figures, the WWE figures that I buy and just throw the package behind me because the focus is on the figure now. And, uh, a little trivia for you all. I never clean it up because it's off camera. So it doesn't bother me except every time I come back to sit down, there's a whole bunch of boxes and uh, I did find out that my wife and son found the mess that I had created, the landfill of toy boxes that was behind my desk. So I guess at some point this weekend, I'll have to clean that up. But I've missed being in here because on Wednesday, I did not get to come down into the Not Sam studio and uh, and cut this here podcast for you. Uh, it's all good. It's just been, you know, I thought that I was going to be able to transition back into life on when, on, you know, on Monday afternoon and Tuesday morning, wake up like everything was normal. But things happened on Tuesday. I got to leave town on Wednesday. I got to do this. I got to do that. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on right now. And even now, we're not done with it. A lot of plates are moving in the air right now. And hopefully, you know, it's stuff. It's all it's all good stuff. Some personal, some professional, some everything. Um, not trying to be too cryptic, but hopefully I'll be able to share everything with you guys here and on SiriusXM and especially in that Discord room for the Not Sam Shills when the time is appropriate, you know, whether whether anything comes to fruition or not. Uh, lots of stories to be told of everything that's been happening. I'm glad, by the way, speaking of the Patreon, uh, a lot of you, the original Hall of Famers, the very first people to sign up on that Hall of Fame level, you got your Not Sam Chalkline jackets in the mail uh, before WrestleMania. Uh, and I will tell you that the people who signed up more recently, as long as you've put in the uh, amount of time required, you will all be getting your Not Sam jackets from Chalkline uh, very, very soon. Uh, I'm getting them all into my possession as we speak. All of them are custom made to order. Uh, you can only get these Not Sam jackets by being a Hall of Fame member of the Not Sam Shills over at patreon.com slash Not Sam Wrestling. But I am glad uh, that a lot of you guys are enjoying your Not Sam jackets. Okay, let's get into it. Let's get into the show this week. Enough. Enough of me describing everything that went on. Uh, because another thing that I did uh, over right before WrestleMania... Uh, I think on uh, Thursday of last week, maybe it was right before I signed off from uh, being a radio person and jumped into WWE world. Uh, Vicky Guerrero was in town. Now, I haven't spoken to Vicky Guerrero, I don't think, since SummerSlam Radio Row many years ago in Los Angeles. I mean, this has to be like five years ago, I guess. How long was how long is maybe three or four years ago? I mean, it was a while ago. It was before. WWE was doing SummerSlam at the Barclays. It was when WWE was doing SummerSlam in LA every year because they did uh, uh, Radio Row at like uh, the Rock and Roll Bowling Alley or wherever it was there in Los Angeles. But uh, I went to LA and uh, found myself a little position and interviewed a ton of uh, people that week. That was one of the first times I think I interviewed Booker T is before we knew each other. Uh, I believe I interviewed... Naomi uh, and uh, what's her face when they were the Funkadactyls? Uh, I inter I think that was the time I interviewed Damian Sandow when he still had his Money in the Bank briefcase and he was in character the whole time. I want to say I interviewed Mick Foley that time. I want it was it was it was super fun. Those radio rows are always so fun. But I think that that was the last time that I spoke to Vicky Guerrero. Uh, however, I found out she was in town and uh, her publicist reached out and said, "Hey, Vicky Guerrero wants to do some interviews." And I said, "I'll talk to Vicky Guerrero." Any minute of the day, argue, I mean, on the short list of best GMs on screen that WWE has ever had. She she took that ball and ran. And also, I would say Vicky Guerrero is on the list for top uh, natural performers in WWE history. I'm talking about the people who came from the outside and just jumped right in with both feet. And all of a sudden, everything just clicked. I think Kurt Angle's on that list. Uh, I think Ronda Rousey's on that list, but I think Vicky Guerrero is on that list. I'm not talking about her in-ring work, but the fact that she sold us all on a character, it's not the easiest thing to do. You know, I'm sure that it helped that she was surrounded by wrestling, being, uh, you know, the the widow of Eddie Guerrero and having the Guerreros all around her. It wasn't exactly a foreign land, but still, the fact she was able to go out on international TV every week, in arenas every week, and sell everybody on this character that she had created is an amazing thing. We got to talk a lot about that character, 
her interactions with uh, one Vince McMahon, the way she left WWE, if she, why she left WWE, if she wants to come back, and a whole lot more. Catching up with this conversation I had uh, WrestleMania week, my guest on the podcast this week is none other than Vicky Guerrero. The Not Sam Wrestling Interview. Well, excuse me. Excuse me! <laughs> Look who's here, Vicky Guerrero. Good morning, it, Sam. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm here in New York City. I know. It's been a really long time. It's, it has. I just I saw your name. I'm like, I wonder if this is the same Sam Roberts I met in L.A. It, that was it, a long time ago. It was. It was for, I don't even remember what year SummerSlam it was. Oh, I don't know. Uh, but it was one. It was back when it was still in L.A. every yes. year. Yeah. And it was at when, a bowling alley. When Radio Row was at a bowling alley. <laughs> it was a hip bowling alley. Yes, but it yeah, was the elite. Yeah. <laughs> But, I mean, what is it like for you, I mean, especially on, like, WrestleMania weekend, you're here for WrestleCon and to do appearances there, but to kind of be around this madness again, because if anybody's familiar with WrestleMania weekend, it's you. Uh, you were able to, you've been able to step aside from it, to step back into it. Do you start going, do you start to feel the itch, or do you... I always miss it. You, you do? Know, especially inside the ring, you know, I watch I watch uh, the product on TV, you know, at home, and I think, gosh, you know, I would love to be in the ring, you know, one more time. Really? Yeah, so you can't ever lose that love for it. You, know, you take the girl out of the wrestling, but you can't take the wrestling out of the girl. <laughs> Is there anything that you watch specifically, or any one that you watch that you go... Yeah, this is. I want to do something with that. Or did the storylines start to formulate in your head at all? Of course. You yeah. know, I always see the women's division. Uh -huh. It's, it's um, become so successful that I wish I was there to be a part of it, you know, because it's so exciting for the women that are uh, able to, you know, main event for WrestleMania and the pay per views. And I was part of the Real Rumble for, you know, the women. And it was just, it's exciting to see what's going on, you know, with WWE and how they're involving the women with the product. Had it changed at all since you left when you went back there to do the Royal Rumble? It's changed a lot because there's so many new faces. Yeah. Especially from, you know, coming from NXT. I don't know. You know, I'm not around it, so I'm not familiar with a lot of faces, but what incredible talent they have. And it's it's pretty interesting what I see every week. <laughs> when, so when you're, I mean, for all the years that, like, Eddie is doing what Eddie did and, and, and wrestling on the levels that Eddie was wrestling at, did you at, have any inclination like, oh, yeah, I could be a performer. <laughs> yeah, like whether it's on the microphone or in the ring, like, oh, yeah, I think I think both of us could do this. Never. I right. Was, I was supposed to be at home, you know, raising the girls while Eddie toured, and that was my role, you know, and I was okay with it because I was kind of the backseat, you know, taking care of the family while Eddie, you know, provided. But, um, you know, once he passed away and then probably about... Uh, four or five months later, I inducted Eddie into the Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. and then um, they asked me in probably... August of that year, you know, you want to come and do a couple of things for Rey Mysterio and, you know, Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho. And I was like, sure, you know, but just two months, you know, nothing, <laughs> nothing, you know, major because I have the girls at home and I like being at home and two months ended up being 10 years. Well, even more than that, because I still go back and forth. <laughs> right. And did you have any sort of like inclination to that it would be as a heel? You know, because I mean, you would think that you're naturally suited as beloved as Eddie, <laughs> honestly, still it was, but yes. still is. Like, you would think clearly you're in this position to be the ultimate good guy. And, you know, in pretty short order. I was never a good guy. Never. <laughs> never. never. <laughs> I was a horrible person on air. <laughs> it, it was great, though. I think maybe watching Eddie for so many years. Yeah. And I always love the heel versus the baby face mm -hmm. you know, because the heel has more fun. And to be able to take the crowd, you know, from booze to maybe believing in me that I was going to be a good guy for that, you know, that night. But then I would turn and become, you know, the horrible person that I was. Yeah. It was fun. You know, I got to manipulate the people in my hand. And that was the, the gift I had you know to see how how mad I could get them for that night so you never you never uh, f felt insecure because you know they say people uh, they they've people have been accused of being afraid of heat you know what I mean mm -hmm. especially when you're not a wrestler you're using your real name you look like your real self like when you go to the grocery store it's me. <laughs> it's Vicky Guerrero there, except maybe not wearing a cougar necklace, right. but everything you else. You never know, Sam. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I don't want to make any judgments, but were you ever uh, presented with something or was there any idea that you would go, I can't, I can't do that because people won't separate it from me? 
Well, I think I was uh, the odds were against me at first because I was Eddie's wife. Right. Um, I had the Guerrero name. Right. A lot of people believe that I didn't deserve to be on stage, or I had a, a place in the WWE, mm-hmm. and I had to earn that in so many ways. And for the McMahon's to believe in me and to have that chance to uh, kind of see what it would be like, you know, and I I loved my character and what they gave me. So when I believed in it and I loved it, it worked. You know, and I, I just had a great time and to work with great people like Edge, um, The Undertaker, um, you know, the girls of Michelle McCool and Layla. Yeah. It was just everything just kind of fell into place. And by the grace of God, you know, he gave me a talent that I was able to use and I loved it. And you were really unaware of that talent before you never before WWE I was never like, used why don't you excuse me at all? Ever <laughs> before. <laughs> did you know you could you had a shrill voice? Did you know you could scream like that? Of course. Well, yeah, yeah I did, did that with that. my kids <laughs> <laughs> and with Eddie, too. But, um, you know, every woman has a little bad side to them so I got to bring that out every night and that was fun right so your kids are watching going like no I know I know I know her I know know that version of of... (laughs) I know that look (laughs) (laughs) how did your kids feel about uh, about uh, Vicky Guerrero and the way you manifested on television they loved it you know these kids were I mean they're just incredible girls that knew what the schedule was like for the wrestling industry and they were used to Eddie being gone for you know long amounts of time and and so for me to be able to sit down with them and say, you know, this is what I might be doing for, you know, for a while, they were great with it. You know, we went through a lot of nannies, some good, some bad, but the good ones made the times a little bit easier. Yeah, but for sure. They were just supportive. And of course, you know, my oldest uh, daughter, Shaw, she was part of NXT and um, she still performs in different uh, wrestling promotions. So it's just something that we always have, you know, accustomed to our lifestyle. Totally. I mean, you, you, the wrestling business and your family, it's like, it is. It just gels all together. It is. <laughs> it's one thing, right? Yes. <laughs> so when the Vicky Guerrero action figure comes out and you're looking at the very first one, are you like, what have we created here? Like we've gotten to a play. There is there. This is a tiny little version of me. This isn't just some. Is that the moment where you go? This isn't just some bit thing that we're doing. This is life. Yeah, especially, you know, uh, to see how they've uh, produced my image into this doll uh-huh. and to see how fans tore their legs apart, their <laughs> arms apart and threw it across the street, you know, uh-huh. making videos. But um, that was just, that was when I knew that, you know, I was able to earn my, my place there. Yeah. And to be on the video games too is something oh really God. exciting. So uh, to play myself and to win against everyone, that was kind of fun. But, you know, it's these are gifts that I always, um, it always be special in my heart. So, who comes to you with the idea like Vicky you're amazing on the microphone we think it's time for you to get in the ring like who comes to you with that idea and what is your initial response well I knew something bad was gonna happen every night because we of course you know we during the day we're at catering and we're getting ready for the show and when I see Vince McMahon come up to me and go Guerrero how are you doing today and that was kind of my cue that every time he did that there was something he wanted me to do that was pretty special so um, he believed in me a lot and uh-huh. I, I love that man you know he's like our family and so for him to have that trust in me to yeah. do something you know on a live show um, I was very honored but but do you remember the first incident when they came to you and said no we want you in a match Oh, uh, gosh. Yeah, it was with Edge. I yeah. think I had to, uh, he had to spear me and I had to spear him. <laughs> and um, they kept telling me, you know, just make sure, you know, when Edge spears you, you don't hit your head on the, you know, turnbuckle because it's going to hurt. And you might, you know, if you get caught on the rope, it could hurt your neck. You know, I was like, just make oh, sure good. you don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> make sure you don't do that. You know, space yourself far enough. But Edge was great. He's such a professional. He yeah. took care of me. And um, he always told me where to be at the right time. And uh, he showed me the psychology of the match and helped me respect it even more of what the whole match was supposed to mean for the night. And that was something that I always take to my heart. How do you make it comfortable with a guy like Edge when you are you're, you're, you're going to be you're going to be doing things physically on camera? that aren't the most comfortable for anybody to see. You know, you're making out. It's very passionate. Those are it's, difficult sounds. They're not difficult <laughs> for you. Those things are difficult. You, you managed to pull that off just fine. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Do yeah. you guys you guys talk about that ahead of time, or do you just go, we know what we're doing here? Uh, they tell us what we're supposed to do, yeah. and you know, we kind of get together and see what's the most disgusting, <laughs> um, rivaled way that we can make everyone upset for the night. Yeah. And so, you know, of course, you know, our making out wasn't romantic and, you know, sincere. It was gross and disgusting and that made it even more real for our storyline well that had i mean edge had to be the perfect person to be paired with because you talk about a guy who just loved being a bad guy oh he was edge was perfect wasn't i still think he's underrated yeah and it's really sad that he had to step away from the ring you know when he had to retire but um just a professional 
I mean, just creative, you know, talent that always used psychology and cared about what was going to happen in the matches. And so to be able to stand by him and, and watch him work was just, it was, uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Now there, there's a, uh, an amazing clip of you, uh, where you cannot, the, the audience will not let you get a word out. I don't know. I, I don't know remember where it was, but it's making it was Austin, it's, Texas. It's, it's kind of making the rounds again. People are like, yes. Do you remember yeah, how it was Dolph Ziggler and yes. uh, John Cena? Yes, and every time you put the mic to your mouth, boo. Oh, it was horrible. Boo. <laughs> I, I think we had like maybe ten minutes to be on air. Uh -huh. And um you know, when they start going over and the guy's in the corner going, okay, guys, you need to wrap it up. And I couldn't finish my promo. And the guy was just like, just go for it. Just go. Just keep on going. But, and of course, John Cena, you know, took advantage of that and just let it drag out even more. But right. It was fun. You know, I, I mean, mean, it seems like a blast. Yeah, it was a little frustrating. I couldn't finish my promo. And, <laughs> and even Dahl was standing there going, what do we do? Like, this has never <laughs> happened to us. Yeah. But, of course, John, you know, he was just uh, so funny and he took advantage of those kind of moments. And uh, I finally got to, you know, get everything out, but it was a fun night. Yeah. Now, when that stuff happens, I mean, it's got to be helpful that John Cena is there with you because I would imagine that even though you want to soak up the moment, right? And like say, like, if this is happening, let's let it be organic. And there's somebody telling you, just keep going, just keep going. Like in your head, you're like, I'm only supposed to be taking up a certain amount of time. I'm taking time away from this person. Yeah. I don't want to get backstage and have well, them go, you went long. But <laughs> when John Cena's in the ring with you, it kind of starts well, to make everything okay. Yeah, if I'm going to get in trouble, he's going to get in trouble too. Right. So <laughs> right. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm not just by myself. <laughs> <laughs> you really are a natural villain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just throw him under the bus with That's you, right? right? That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Do you have a favorite. Uh, moment or angle or match or anything that you go like yeah that this is this is the thing that I want to be the legacy of Vicky Guerrero in the WWE yeah I think the the one um, unforgettable moment was with the Undertaker when he tombstone me <laughs> because I'm the only female that was able to get tombstone from him yeah and I uh, and, you know, Undertaker didn't rehearse this at all. Mm -hmm. You know, he was like, kid, don't worry about it. You know, just, <laughs> just uh, whenever I lift you up, just Call go with, limp and yeah. I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll lift you up. He goes, just uh, make sure you don't you don't fall down from my waist because you only have three inches before your neck breaks. You know, so I was just like, my neck is going to break. Possibly this is good. The last day that I'm going to be here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but he was just, it was so much fun. And, um, you know, I wanted to do it again when it was over with. It you was, did. It was such a high. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, he, he went back stage and he was like are you okay and I'm like let's go do this again <laughs> you know yeah, but... because the reaction I mean not only so in your head you're going oh my god I'm getting tombstone by the undertaker right now yes. this is there's there's you get leg dropped by Hulk Hogan you get tombstone by the undertaker <laughs> it's about as legendary as it could possibly get yeah. and because you're the only female that that's going to happen to the crowd is losing their minds. Oh, they went nuts. Yeah. Because, you know, there was a payoff, you know, for Undertaker because for months I was tantalizing him and giving him <laughs> such horrible nights, you know, and taking championships from him. And, yeah. of course, I had Edge. So, Edge, was, I was helping him cheat to win. And, um, you know, so I guess there's always a payback for the villain, right? Of course there is. <laughs> and it was for that night. And it was just, it was a lot of fun. And um, I was scared because, you know, I wasn't... A natural in the ring. I never had any training. And for really, the, <laughs> and for the Undertaker to tell me, you know, just trust me and don't, just don't drop, hold me tight. You know, I was, I was, uh, I was a fan, and also, you know, just um, in shock. You know, I was able to do this. So for him to trust me with this, I was, I was excited. Did you know going in that okay, like before you start wrestling, before you start doing anything physical, did you know? when you started feeling the amount of heat you were getting and the booze that you were getting. Like, if, if you're f really familiar with wrestling, you know this, whether they tell me or not, I know this has to be paid off physically. That's the only thing you can do with this kind of energy. Did you know, because you were so close to the business, that at some point, even before they told you, like, yeah, this is going to have to... Well, I never thought they would have me go in the ring and do a match, you know, because I thought there was a, a special love for me, and, you know, <laughs> like some attention, you know, well, this is Vicky Guerrero, you know, Eddie's yeah. wife. We can't put her in a match. She's, right. she's not, you know, trained for this. But, um, you know, when I started seeing that, you know, how bad I was going to be towards the other characters mm -hmm. and to know that, oh, Vicky, you're going to have a match next week. I'm like, what? <laughs> this, is, this is insane. Do you know, yeah, do you know who, who I, I am? am? <laughs> Excuse me? But, you know, the guys were great, you know, to they took care of me. And, um, 
um, and I loved it, you know, to be able to take bumps and to uh, cheat, you know, and be ridiculous in these dance offs and run from the ring. And they would, of course, you know, you know, they would catch me. It was just fun, you know, and it added on to my character. And the more they allowed me to do, the more that I wanted to just keep taking more. Yeah, you were talking about having to like kind of prove yourself and why you were there and and all that. But I would imagine that pretty quickly. I mean, I know like as a fan, when you can see somebody's level of commitment to the performance, right? Like you can see when you're watching Raw or SmackDown when somebody who's new either doesn't get it or doesn't take it seriously or shouldn't mm-hmm. be there. And then you can see when somebody like they are the character. Like I just can't see a difference. They are locked in. And I feel like from day one, you were locked into that character. Like you took it seriously. You 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 performed with absolutely everything that you had and I would imagine that pretty quickly the locker room and and the the guys go okay she's here for the right reasons like this is going to be good for all of us well you know Sam that's interesting because when I walked into the ladies locker room the first time I was the heaviest lady there Mm -hmm. and we had these beautiful gorgeous ladies that were you know like Tori Wilson and Charmel Um, you had uh, Lita you know these were gorgeous ladies I thought I am not going to survive in this industry there's no way Mm -hmm. but what I had to prove to myself was it wasn't going to be how I look it's going to be my talent inside and I loved the industry for what it was before I even stepped in you Mm -hmm. know to the locker room so to know that they allowed me to have to be a character I wanted to do my my best and that was something that was important to me so when they gave me the heel you know um character and I was able to uh you know take a little bit of Eddie, you know, and put that into my character and, uh, you know, just be creative on my own. It was just, it it all worked. Yeah. What do you attribute your kind of natural ability to? Is it just simply instinct? Because, you know, going out there and, and cutting long heel promos every single show and maintaining that energy every single show, like you had, you had, the reactions you were getting were exactly the reactions that you were supposed to be getting and they were real and that I think sometimes people take for granted your ability to get those reactions when the truth is that people train for years and still can't get those reactions yeah well I had God on my side you know I always prayed before I went out and it it please God let them hate me (laughs) please (laughs) please let them hate me if they didn't they didn't like me and they if they didn't hate me then you know there's they can't put you back on air. You know, if it's not working, they're not going to keep using you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, to be able to uh, work at my craft, and I had a lot of great people that helped me. I had Dusty Rhodes. I had, um, uh, you know, Chavo. I had Teddy Long. I had Paul Heyman, who was just incredible to show me, you know, different ways. Because my very first prom I went out as, you know, Vicky Guerrero, I sucked. Mm-hmm. I, I was horrible. And I went through Gorilla and Dusty. Could you feel it as you were doing it? Oh, yeah. I was just like, I'm not going to last here <laughs> at all. Because they gave me a long promo. I mean, right. It was something that I thought they are going to gradually, you know, get me in there. But um, do you get, do you, is it one of those things where you get like halfway through the promo and you're going, oh, no, this isn't going well. Yeah, the this sweat's isn't... going behind my ears <laughs> and, you know, my my fingers feel tingly. You know? <laughs> but you finished it. <laughs> I did. You got through it. Yeah. And you go through Gorilla. And um, Dusty Rhodes is standing there and he's like, three high. You suck. <laughs> we need to work on this. <laughs> and he he took me under his wing, you know, and just sat down with me and just showed me how to have confidence and not show them that I was scared. And he goes, "If you want to do this, do it all the way. You can't hold back." And that's when I was starting to let go a little bit and not be so scared. That I was Eddie's wife, or you know, that I didn't belong there. I had to believe in myself, and that's yeah. what worked. Isn't it great to have people around you to tell you when you suck? Yeah, I mean, it was very hard to hear for. Oh, yeah, it's horrible, but it's. <laughs> Like it's, it's but, somehow being told that you suck is way better than in the long term than somebody lying and being like, yeah. no, no, it was great. It was yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. You see the horrible articles in the next day. Like, she <laughs> yeah. doesn't belong there. Yeah. Ah, they don't know what they're talking about. I don't <laughs> listen to Justin them. Tell me it was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, for everyone to be real backstage because it was this affected them too. Of it's course. everyone's product. So when I heard the bad news or the bad advice and I was like, okay, I need to work on this. Mm-hmm. And I did have a lot to work on. You know, I didn't do this before. Of course. So, um, you know, year after year, I just, you know, kind of dug a little deeper and always watched everyone else. You know, Sherry Martel was a great, you know, role model. Oh, my God. That's the perfect um, role model. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm watching, you know, like Miss Elizabeth and just watching the guys, too. You know, Shawn Michaels do an interview. You just kind of take little bits and pieces and look at their their body language and how they present their promos. And you just kind of start, you know, reading into it a little bit more. What is that feeling like for the first promo? Because, I mean, you didn't even you didn't 
work at all. You didn't. It's not like you were doing indies and you were doing this. Yeah. Like you were obviously housewife too. <laughs> that's it, right? To go, yeah. To go right to WWE. Yes. The first time, because you can practice. You can rehearse your lines. You can step in the ring before the show so you can kind of feel what the dimensions are like. Yeah. But what I can't imagine is the first time that you step in the ring and then you look up and it's 20,000 people uh. and they're all just staring at you waiting. Like that has to be the most intimidating it's horrible. thing in the world. I never understand, especially it's one thing, you know, maybe you can get used to it somewhat. But for somebody like you, the very first time it's happening, I don't even understand how the brain would function. Yeah. You know, I mean, thank God I got to work with Eddie before he passed away. Yes. So um, to be able to work at SummerSlam and some other live TV events, you know, where we were pr- promoting the Dominic storyline. Right. Um, I got a little bit of taste of what it was to have, you know, the big crowd. And at SummerSlam, I mean, that's when I threw Eddie on the, you know, off the ladder. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so... I, that helped a little bit because I kind of felt the you knew you know, the feeling. The crowd. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, but I was the good guy. You know, because right. I went against Eddie, so that was that was a fun feeling. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. You know, intimidating is when you know you're doing rehearsals and Vince McMahon wants to hear your promo before you go live, and everyone around the ring is just standing there watching you, and you're like. Now you want me to do this now, you know, and I I was horrible. I, I didn't do very well. And you're the like, you're the second person this week that's told me. Yeah, I mean, it's intimidating being in front of the arena for the first time, but doing it for Vince is oh, way it's, worse. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah. It's horrible because he has no face on him. He's uh-huh. stone face. And all he told me was, we need to clean this up in two hours. You know, and I was just like, oh. yeah, two hours. Is that all, is that all I have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then he's on to the next thing. It's overwhelming. Yeah, and they do rehearsals. And you're going, what does you know? clean this up mean? What is this? Yeah. What yeah. Yeah, very overwhelming. Wow. But it pushed me. It, yes. It did push me to memorize my lines and <laughs> get going. Well, it becomes very sink or swim, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you does. And you chose to swim. Isn't it great? seeing uh dominic back on tv now I have you seen that ray has it. dominic with him he's gonna he's you know what's gonna happen with this storyline right it's what gonna you, be son versus father i hope so it, of course it will yeah. it, it has to come to an end sometime but that's what i want to see it's gonna be great i just love that that storyline like lives forever because as soon as i saw dominic i was like oh you fought for his custody in a ladder match. <laughs> like, <laughs> now Ray looks like the kid. He's so totally, short. yeah, yeah. Dominic's tall. Yeah, yeah. you know what? Uh, I'll tell you when uh, when Ray was returning for the Royal Rumble, I was there. I was doing the kickoff. I saw him that night. Yeah, I was doing. Yeah. I was doing the. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That was your Rumble. Both yeah, surprises. Right, right. Yes, and I didn't see either of you because I was over doing the thing over there. But I went out into the crowd for the Rumble, and I didn't know anything that was going to happen. But before Ray came out. I saw this tall kid get walked past me to go to sit on the floor and I looked at his face and I was like, wait, is that I'm your poppy? Is that, is that Dominic? And I went, oh, I bet Ray's here. I knew it because I remember, because <laughs> I knew his face from, yeah. from when he's a tiny little kid. Yeah, because they keep us in this room, you know, where no one can see who's the, who the surprises are. And yeah. uh, we walked in, I'm like, he goes, you're here? I go, you're here? <laughs> you know, but uh, we talked a little bit and it's just great to see, you know, see him again, you know, and these are great. Yeah. When WWE has functions and we get to see our old friends, it's just a big family. So Absolutely. it's always a good time. Was there any worry when you go out for the Royal Rumble that year? Was there any worry... People aren't going to care. People aren't going to remember me. Of course there is. There is. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there is. because, you know, I've been gone. You know, I was the one who chose to retire. Right. But, um, you know, the way they had me come out and, you know, of course, I tried to win, but it didn't last very long. <laughs> it, it's ju- it's still a great feeling, you know, to go out there and to know that the fans are going to react to the excuse me and to my whining and throwing a tantrum. Uh, it's it's a it's a blessing. Yeah. When you say excuse me and you still get that reaction, is that like the. Oh my God! Everything's okay. This is going to be really fun, actually. I can still come back and do this again. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's great. It's the adrenaline is so it's it's overwhelming. What made you retire? What 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 made it so that you wanted to retire? Well, it, I had been there for ten years. Yeah, you know, and um, I you, you start getting used less and less in the shows. You're traveling, you know, all over the place, and when you're spending more time in the locker room than you are in the ring, mm-hmm. you start wondering, you know, is this my time to get out? You mm-hmm. know, is it time to retire and um, I wanted to do other things in life. You know, I wanted to do acting and finish school. And I wanted to spend some time with my girls before they, they moved out because they were um, they both had graduated from high school. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, I think this is, I wanted to leave before you get released and they wish you well in your future endeavors. Right, right. 
Right. Leave them wanting just a little bit more. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. But I still have my doors open, which was really important for me when I talked to Vince that um, I want to, I would like to leave, you know, but I gave him a year advance. So I was. Very oh, a year. Pre- you, oh, oh wow. Okay. I gave him a year. I said, I'd like to, you know, leave within the year. And they were very respectful of that. Was there any point when you give that kind of advance? Was there any point throughout the year where you were like, oh, Maybe I shouldn't have done that. I mean, yes, there's always those shows <laughs> yeah. where like, maybe I, should, maybe I shouldn't like, you know, quit, but. Because I feel like when you give a two-week notice, sometimes by Thursday, you're like, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Can I take that back? <laughs> no, but I, I prepared myself. I, I moved to Houston, you know, because I was in the medical field, so I wanted, I found a job over there mm-hmm. and just kind of set myself up, you know, to where I kind was, of started I was life. ready to yeah. leave, you know, whenever that, that final date came. And um, it was great. You know, Stephanie McMahon gave me the, the match of a lifetime, and mm-hmm. for her to be able to be so involved and she goes I want to be a part of this I'll always um, be grateful to her for her involvement yeah I guess people outside of wrestling uh, will never understand but like the way you left it felt kind of perfect like you know it, it was too perfect right i was like why did y'all make this so so hard <laughs> yeah yeah like to to an outsider it might be like this is humiliating why yeah. would you do this but i'm watching it and i'm like it's poetic right yeah it was and they surprised me with eddie's music at the end and yeah uh, they didn't tell me, you know, so that was like, you know, it was special, you know, so it was, it was And a you're doing the Eddie dance when you're dripping. Yeah, and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. are in the mud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that mud made out of? It was like dog food and flour and some chocolate pudding. It was disgusting. <laughs> Even the fans that were by there, they're like, this smells so bad. I'm like, you're not in this. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's amazing. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that you're back out and, uh, and doing signings and things like that. Are you always surprised at the signings at how much love there still is for Vicky I Guerrero am. yeah I was at WonderCon last week mm-hmm. and uh, this this week I'll be at uh, WrestleCon mm-hmm. and then of course the um, and next week I'll be at the El Paso Comic Con and the fan uh, love and support is just incredible and uh, I'm grateful because this is my time to be able to talk to the fans and say thank you for all the love and support I feel like when people make their lists of GMs you know, of the, of the great GMs, or even when people are like, oh, there might be a new GM, you're always at the top of those lists. Thank like, you. I mean, and I, I don't know many people who don't put you on that list of either their favorite GMs or when they go, they're bringing a GM in to do Raw or SmackDown. Uh, very quickly into those conversations, Thank there's you, people yeah. going like, oh, they should bring Vicky back or, or... I would love to. I mean, I, I always miss it. You yeah. Know? And I always think that, you know, if I was a voice for Ronda Rousey, I think that would be like incredible to be her man. Oh, especially I this version prom- of Ronda Rousey? Yeah. 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 I saw her promo one night and I was just like, she needs someone to talk for her. <laughs> She's incredible. Full of strength. I mean, just She's a great. brilliant athlete. Right. I mean, I would hate to be on her wrong side. But, but the way think- you can get under people's skin. Yeah. I think that would just be such a great combination, you yeah. know, to have a little bit of my, you know, chemistry with hers. I think that would be fun. But did you learn a lot? Did you, how much did you work with Paul Heyman? Because I do feel like now that you're saying that, there is a lot of that sort of kind of a female equivalency to advocate Paul Heyman in. Vicky Guerrero. I, I love Paul. I mean, he's such a strong character, mm-hmm. but he's not a character. That's who he is. I yeah. mean, it comes so natural to him, but he, uh, we got to work in the ring several times mm-hmm. and even on house shows and just backstage, you know, he would always give me pointers and, and he would just, and he, what was great about him is he never wanted a verbiage. He didn't care about scripts. He goes, and I was like, oh, here's your script. He goes, we don't use scripts out there. And I'm like, so (laughs) what are we going to do, Paul? And he goes, let's just go out there and have fun. And it was the best time I had with him because I always look forward to working with him because there was no words. It was, he goes, we know the storyline. Let's just go have fun with it. And it was, it was brilliant. Just brilliant with him. It's awesome. It's, it's also so funny that you went from. Well, okay, I'm just going to come in and do a couple things here and there to not only being on TV every week, but you're on the like you're on the house show loops. I know. <laughs> you saying that you're working with Paul at house shows just like triggered in my oh, mind. Oh, it was incredible. Like, and house shows are so much fun. Full time, full time. But yeah, yeah, I mean, there's no time limit. You can go out there and just have fun. And, yeah. You know, it, it was it was just a, it was like a, a fun time. You know, and there's no stress of TV and time limits and you know who's where. You know, where's the camera? It's just go out there and let's have a good time. Are you going to try to pop by WrestleMania while you're here this weekend, or are you the type that? Uh, that only comes when you're doing something. No, I'm going to be with WWE tomorrow night. I'm oh, doing great. a table for three with Kurt Angle and Eric Bischoff. 
Oh my God! Yes, that's I'm fantastic. Very excited. So I'll be doing that. And I'll, I'm going to cruise the hotel and see who's there and say hi. That's awesome. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's yeah. such a good weekend to do it all, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's uh, it's such a fun weekend. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Well, Vicky, uh, it's so good seeing you again. Thank you, Sam. It was Hopefully, good to see you. yeah, you too. Hopefully, I wish we'll... you so much success and love. Oh my God! Thank you so much, and same to you. Thank you. And hopefully, we'll see each other again a lot uh, a lot quicker than this time yes. from the last time. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you, Vicky. Sam. Here is Sam Roberts. Oh, Vicky hasn't missed a step. And I have to believe that if WWE were to ever bring back the uh, the GM position on television, she would be a shoe in I mean, I, I don't see how you could argue that she's not. Who, who are the best? I think uh, Eric Bischoff was an incredible general manager. Technically, Stone Cold Steve Austin was a sheriff. Although, if they brought him in to be a GM, I'm sure it'd be great. Um... I don't know. Mick Foley was a good commissioner, not a great GM. Kurt Angle, not the greatest GM in the world. Great Olympic hero, not the greatest GM. Uh, you know, who else? There's not that many. I think there were more GMs that were not that great than that were great. Vicky Guerrero is on that list of great. I think uh, Ric Flair was awesome. Obviously, any of the McMahons and in authority figures are always awesome. Um but I think if if at any point, Paige was a great GM. Paige was really good. I think that if at any point the WWE decides it's time to uh, bring in some kind of authority foil for somebody, she's a shoe in She's just a natural at it, and I feel like she could do it forever. A um, couple of things going on this week. Uh, I'm excited over on the WWE Network. I haven't checked it out yet. But with all the buzz, you know, I think we talked about it last week. There was the story of the Tom McGee match with Bret Hart that might finally see the day. Uh, you can go on YouTube. There are people who have done tremendous jobs of compiling the Tom McGee story. Uh, I think there's a clip of Colt Cabana talking about it on his podcast that's really, really good. Um, but the Tom McGee story is the story of the guy who was supposed to be the next Hulk Hogan and just didn't work out at all. Uh, but... I don't know if WWE just can't find this Bret Hart match because the Bret Hart match, they say, is so important because Bret, it was supposed to be that that they saw the match with Bret. They said, oh, my God, he really is the next guy. Then they realized with every other match that Tom McGee had that it was just Bret carrying him through all that. And the ironic thing ended up being that in the match with Bret Hart versus Tom McGee, they did see the person that would take the reins of the company after Hulk Hogan. And it wasn't Tom McGee. It was the Hitman. Uh, but the WWE Network in the Hidden Gems section has added a match that I don't think anybody's ever seen. And that's Tom McGee versus Ted DiBiase. I would put Ted DiBiase in that Bret Hart category of people who could carry just about anybody into an incredible match. I would put Bret Hart, Ted DiBiase, Ric Flair, Macho Man Randy Savage. I mean, these are the guys who can do that. So I'm very, very excited to watch that Tom McGee match on the WWE Network. Um, I've also seen some internet rumblings that at least Sasha Banks, if not Sasha Banks and Bayley, being uh, upset with the company, uh, with WWE, and that you know there being rumors now that Sasha Banks may leave WWE or that Sasha Banks and Bayley together may leave WWE, and, you know, that's always a disappointment. I always get disappointed when people who have been very public about the fact that this is their dream. Like, it's it's never... It's just listen to her music. Had a dream, I had a minute. The first part of that song is Had a Dream, I. And she's talking about having her dreams. You know, it's never been a secret that Sasha Banks and Bailey, that this is all they want to do. And then it's not... I don't think in the beginning, and maybe it turns into that, but I don't think in the beginning it was even about I just want to wrestle forever. I think that the dream that Sasha Banks and Bailey had was to become WWE superstars. Was to, I think they had the dream to main event WrestleMania. Now, that can only happen, you know, I, I was going to say to one person, but to three people. It happened to three people this year. However, you know, Sasha Banks and Bailey will always have that place in history. Let's be honest. There's nothing, and I'm not saying that they do. I'm, I have no clue. I haven't spoken to Sasha Banks or Bailey or WWE or anybody about any of this. So I'm just making it up as I go. I'm just speculate, speculating based on, you know, internet reports, the same ones that you've read, I've read. But, you know, I, I it seems like they were happy being women's tag team champions. If the main event is what they're looking for, it's, 
it's, you know, I mean, I don't think that it has anything to do with the main event. It probably has more to do with these women tag team championships. I mean, Sasha Banks did get to shine at WrestleMania 32. Remember the triple threat match between Charlotte, Sasha Banks, and Bayley. That was the match that brought back the women's championship. I think when you have, when you talk about important women's matches at WrestleMania, of course, the match at WrestleMania 35 on Sunday will always be number one. It's the first main event. But I think a close number two right under it is that WrestleMania 32 triple threat match. I would put that above Charlotte versus Asuka, certainly. I would put that above Ronda's mixed tag match from last year. Uh, I would say that the WrestleMania 32 match was, while it wasn't technically the main event, it is the match that put the women on the side of the stadium, and it is the match that brought the WWE out of the Divas era and back into the women's era. So I think that that was really important. To be a part of history like that is a, is a huge deal. But that was three years ago. How do you maintain that momentum? How does anybody do it? You know? And if Sasha Banks or Sasha Banks and Bailey have gotten so kind of tired of all the rigmarole that they just aren't passionate about what's going on anymore, that's a real shame. You know? That stinks because Sasha Banks and Bailey are awesome. Everybody knows Sasha Banks has been one of my, has been, I'm sorry, there was a period of time where Sasha Banks was my favorite wrestler, one of my favorite wrestlers for a long time. You look in the, in the uh, collectibles, in the, in the WWE museum section of the Not Sam studio that's still in progress of being built. And I have four velvet paintings done by artist Bruce White. And these are not prints. These are the actual velvet paintings as displayed in galleries 1988 in Los Angeles. These are real works of art that I paid a whole bunch of money for. I got The Undertaker, I got Owen Hart, I got The Rock, and when it came time to pick a modern day superstar, and by the way, it's not like depending on the superstar, these paintings cost more or less, it's just which one do you want? I picked Sasha Banks. I think that that Sasha Banks represents a lot. I think that Sasha Banks adds a lot. You know, I mean, I think that any time that Sasha Banks has been in a position to deliver, she delivers tenfold. You know, I don't think that there was that much going on with Sasha Banks leading into Royal Rumble. And she had one of Ronda Rousey's best matches. When you look at the matches that Ronda Rousey had in the year that she was in WWE, in the first year that she was in WWE, I don't know if she's gone or not. But in the first year that Ronda Rousey was in WWE, if you look at those matches... The Sasha Banks Royal Rumble match is at the top of the list. Not that it's the best match she had. It's one of the best matches she had. And that was because of, you know, not only Ronda's ability, but Sasha Banks' abilities. So, you know, I really hope that maybe she takes a little bit of time to clear her head and process things and just gets into a better place. You know, maybe she needs to leave and come back for a while. Who knows? But, you know, I just think that Sasha Banks is a very, very valuable performer but I also think that she seems like she thinks about this stuff a lot and she's very 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 passionate about this stuff and the thing is that when you're living your dream and when you're passionate about something sometimes that passion can lead you to a place where where stuff hurts more than it should quite frankly you want to you know it's not just a gig when you're that passionate about what you do it's not just a matter of going in, doing what they ask you to do to the best of your ability and collecting that check. Your emotions are tied into it. That's where passion comes from, is emotion. And you can't turn that off. So, you know, if, if the stuff that's going on with her hurts more than it should, more than it, a normal business would, you got to do what you got to do in this life. And the people who say that she's complaining too much and bitching about it on social media and whatnot. I mean, you know, I don't... I'm not pro going to social... I, I think social media should be used as a business tool, personally. I think that, that for superstars, if they're not in character, going to social media doesn't really do much for anybody. But, you know, you say you want a revolution, well, you know... We all want to change the world. On another note, you want a, a certain degree of, of closeness with these superstars. This is what it is. This is what it sounds like. So hopefully Sasha Banks figures out what she's looking for um, and we get there.
Uh, but let's, speaking of getting there, let's get into it. Let's get in to this week's State of Wrestling. It's now time for this week's State of Wrestling. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. State of Wrestling time. And what a State of Wrestling we've got. This is technically, I know it feels like a lifetime ago, but the post-WrestleMania edition of the State of Wrestling here on Not Sam Wrestling. Of course, we're streaming live on video for everybody at patreon.com slash Not Sam Wrestling. Well, not everybody, but the superstar level shills and above are able to watch it live. Then the uh, indie darling level shills and above are able to watch the video at their leisure whenever they want the full State of Wrestling video only at patreon.com slash Not Sam Wrestling. Let's get into it. WrestleMania weekend. That's where we start off story number five. Because you know on State of Wrestling, we're counting down those top five stories, according to yours truly, the last professional broadcaster. And story number five is WrestleMania 35. And was it a success or was it not? Look, you know, I think that regardless of of WrestleMania, you're going to have some people leaving going, that was the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. There's never been a WrestleMania in my adult life that I've been monitoring these things that somebody hasn't thought it was the worst thing they've ever seen in their entire life. But you cannot tell me if you're being honest, if you're not being cynical, if you're just being uh, right down the middle, just calling it like you see it, that WrestleMania 35 was not a good show. It was a very good, excuse me, it was a very good show. Uh, It's long. Here's the thing. I believe that if you watch WrestleMania 35 over the course of two or three days, you're going to sit there and go, man, that was a good show. Man, a lot of stuff happened. Man, I got all the feels as I was watching that. But if you watch for seven and a half hours straight, you know, at some point you're going to sit there and the same thing happened at Royal Rumble. You know, was the Batista Triple H match good? Yeah, it was really good. The story being told inside the match was great. You know, the stuff that was happening as it was happening was awesome. I thought that both of them did a really great job and delivered on everything that we wanted to see. However, when you've been watching wrestling for five plus hours, five and a half hours, and you know that there's still two and a half hours of matches left to go, you're going to be looking at that match wanting it to end because you just want to get to the part that you want to get to. And that's the tough part about doing live, long live shows. It just is. If you take the length of the show out of the equation, WrestleMania was pretty incredible. You know, to start with Hulk Hogan, well, who got a great reaction at MetLife. So regardless of controversy, I think that he's going to do, be just fine in WWE. Then to, to go with the big shocker, which was to start the show with Paul Heyman walking out and the Brock Lesnar-Seth Rollins match happening. Talk about delivering and giving fans what they wanted, or at least what they said they wanted. You left that show. First of all, on the pre-show, you got Tony Nese winning the Cruiserweight title. You got Braun Strowman having his moment winning the Andre Battle Royal. You've got Ryder and Hawkins winning the tag team title, finally a a heroic end to the longest losing streak in the history of WWE and Kurt Hawkins, winning the tag team championship in his hometown with the guy that he's been with forever. You then start the show with Seth Rollins getting his moment, winning the WWE Universal Championship and doing it by beating Brock Lesnar, which means the Universal title actually comes back to Raw. Now, it did come to Raw, and for some reason it was fastened with Velcro, and I don't know why, but I saw the photo. I don't know if Seth Rollins wanted the Velcro on it, or that was a Brock Lesnar thing, and there's just still Velcro on it. But I believe the last person who had Velcro on a championship title was Macho Man Randy Savage. That's the way he wanted his Winged Eagle title to be, if I remember correctly. Uh, So I don't... don't, uh, I don't know why that is. I think it's interesting, though. There's a little uh, uh, belt aficionado. I don't know if I'm an aficionado, but I love championship titles. Um, So you've got Seth Rollins beating Brock Lesnar. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Brock doesn't have the title hostage, and Seth Rollins is the champion. All good news, right? You've got uh, AJ winning his match. You've got the Usos getting their WrestleMania win. You've got the Iconics shocking the world. You have Kofi winning the championship at Kofi Mania. You know, you've got Becky beating, pinning Ronda Rousey 1-2-3, winning that triple threat and closing WrestleMania as the champ champ to belt Becky. I don't know what more that show could have done 
to win people over. You got your John Cena moment, which even people who were going, oh, I don't want him to just, you know, interrupt Elias. Like, I want something to happen. He comes out as the doctor of thugonomics and does an old school, ruthless aggression era freestyle. You know, it's pretty, pretty tough to tell me the WWE didn't succeed with WrestleMania 35. I thought they did a good job, and I, it felt like a WrestleMania that had fans in mind. It didn't have fans in mind in terms of uh, improving their sleep schedules, but it had fans in mind in terms of delivering the results. The only way you're going to decrease... So here's the thing, you know, in, in one breath... And by the way, it's even got your dips. You've got your moment where... Uh, uh, Kurt Angle gets beat and you're upset. You got your moment where Samoa Joe taps out Rey Mysterio Jr. in less than a minute. So it's got your moments of like, oh no, it's got everything. Now, uh, the only way to shorten the show is to have less matches, which I am actually for. I think they should have less matches on the show. But that also means that you can't go on the internet and complain. You can't, here's what you can't do. You can, if you want to complain about one or the other, you can. But you can't complain about, uh, the length of the show, and people being left off the show. So if you're one of these people going, well, this person should be on the show, you can't be one of these people going the show's too long, and vice versa. Um, so, so, so that's the only thing. You can complain about one or the other, that's no problem, but it's going to mean, and I think that, I don't think it's such a bad thing if people are left off the show. Not that I don't want ever to see everybody succeed, but... You know, I think it gives people something to work for. I think it gives people something to strive for. You know, I have to be my absolute best because it's going to WrestleMania is not an entitlement. It's a privilege. Only the best of the best get to perform on the grandest stage of them all. And that's part of being part of a show that has multiple brands connected with it, that has deep, deep talent rosters. So, you know, I think that that's... Uh, a big part of it, but I thought uh, WrestleMania weekend as a whole was great. Uh, very happy to watch the WWE locker room come together and uh, remind that guy, that scumbag who interrupted Bret Hart's speech exactly why nobody should be doing stuff like that. Especially uh, Scott Dawson. Good for him. You know, I, I, I enjoyed seeing the WWE roster come together and teach that guy a lesson. Um, as I was sitting there in the stands, TakeOver was incredible. I mean, TakeOver was incredible. And to do another, and it was incredible by TakeOver standards, which is not an easy thing to do. You know, to have a main event that you know is a replacement main event. Tommaso Ciampa versus Johnny Gargano is the best story told in wrestling in 2018. Maybe in 2017 as well. It's the best story that's been told. So to lose that match, a world title match that we know is the culmination of everything, we knew that at Takeover New York, if we had Ciampa versus Gargano, it would be the fine. It would be here. It is here. Is this is the end of the story? To not only get robbed of that match, but get robbed of that moment and have the replacement match still be a match that you walk out of Takeover going, oh my god. You know, I think takeovers are the best shows in pro wrestling. The best. And and they certainly lived up to it this weekend. I mean, and you go through it. You know, the women's fatal four-way was good. The main event, Cole versus Gargano, was incredible. Uh, the U.S. or the North American Championship match between Riddle and Velveteen Dream was awesome. And I was right. Riddle choked. And good. I'm glad he choked. Because it was nice to see the Velveteen Dream shine. You know, uh, the, the tag title match, which, by the way, I was right. I thought that Aleister Black and Ricochet had too much on their plate, and they did. They lost all their matches this weekend. But it was still an awesome match. Um, and then the, the UK Championship match, seeing uh, Pete Dunne finally lose that title to Walter. Just awesome top-to-bottom show. Really, really great stuff. Um, and a great weekend altogether. I think for WWE and for WWE fans. Uh, let's get to story number four, which is the Raw after WrestleMania. And I guess the SmackDown after WrestleMania, the 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 wind down from WrestleMania and the, and the results of it. You know, I think that uh, 
Some people were surprised that there wasn't more happening on the Raw, especially after WrestleMania. But look, the WWE decided to call up, you know, think about it. In the last couple months, they called up, technically they called up Gargano and Ciampa, right? So technically that was a call up. But they called up Gargano and Ciampa. They called up Aleister Black. They called up Ricochet. Right before that, they called up uh, Lacey Evans. They called up EC3. They called up Heavy Machinery. They called up Lars Sullivan. You know, all this stuff just happened. So the idea that they would go back and raid NXT's talent roster again uh, doesn't seem right. So I get why that didn't happen. Also, the Superstar Shakeup is happening next week. So I would not be at all surprised to see NXT roster members coming to the main roster during the Superstar Shakeup. You know, I think that that was being saved. What you did see on Raw was a mixture of people going from show to show. I don't mind that happening at the Raw after WrestleMania with Drew McIntyre showing up on SmackDown, with Kofi showing up on Raw with The New Day, with all that happening. I don't mind those uh, those brand lines being blurred because next week is the Superstar Shakeup, so who knows where anybody's going to end up anyway. I think that once the Superstar Shakeup is over and everything has been cemented, that's when you go and say, okay, no more jumping from from show to show. But in the meantime, I don't mind it. You had The Undertaker make the appearance against Elias. I can only imagine because it's building to a match that the two are going to have. You know, I would think that if this weren't going to be a match that you would see that moment at WrestleMania. But I think even a bigger story here is how great it is that all these legends are intimidated by Elias. All these legends... You know, it used to be Randy Orton was the legend killer. He had to call out legends to get their attention. Elias is just trying to do his thing, and he's getting interrupted by John Cena. He's getting interrupted by The Undertaker. And by the way, if you listen to that uh, interview that we did with him on Jim Norton and Sam Roberts, we put it out on the bonus WrestleMania podcast that we put out uh, a week or so ago. Elias, I asked him, who would you want to be in the ring with at a WrestleMania if you weren't performing? You know, if you weren't singing your song, who would you want to have a match with? And he said, you got to be like John Cena. It's got to be like The Undertaker. Sunday, John Cena. Monday, The Undertaker. He was tipping his hat to us. But I love that these legends are are, are sitting here uh, intimidated by Elias, just trying to get some of that Elias shine. I think it's great. And it goes to show you how great Elias is. Um, Sami Zayn's return on Raw and SmackDown. That little... Uh, a little head nod from him on SmackDown. I love the idea that Sami Zayn is uh, is is the troll hunter. That Sami Zayn is tired of these trolls on the internet. I love it. And I said on Twitter that I loved it. And so many people were like, oh, well, you're the troll he's going to come after. And I told him, I'm not a troll. I have earned a platform for myself. Trolls are the nincompoops on the internet that are thinking that their opinion actually means something. Me? I get handed a microphone every day. Clearly, my opinion means something. Uh, so I thought Sammy was awesome. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens with the Superstar Shakeup. That's what I'm interested in. Okay, let's move on to story number three. Story number three is uh, injuries that have happened post-WrestleMania. So apparently, we're going to have to deal with uh, Big E being out of action for a while. I, I don't know if he hurt himself doing that split on Raw, the split on SmackDown, or someplace else. But Big E is going to be out of action, which, honestly, at this moment, I'm happy about, and I'll tell you why. Number one, we can still get Big E on television because Big E is entertaining even when he's not wrestling, and the fact that you've got Kofi Kingston as WWE champion, you know, it's not going to hurt to, even if he's on crutches. I don't know how long he's going to be out for. I don't know exactly what his injury is, but he's going to be out for a little while. But that's fine. Even on crutches, Big E coming to the ring with Kofi Kingston is entertaining. But number two, it's because as long as Big E is injured, he can't turn on Kofi. Because as I said from the beginning, all I want is for the New Day to stay together. There's absolutely no reason that Kofi or, or Xavier should turn on Big E. I mean, uh, Co uh, Big E or Xavier should turn on Kofi. I think that that's where the WWE should do things differently. That... Uh, that we shouldn't have that split that so many people are, are telecasting. 
you know, that so many people see coming. People were talking about that for the Raw after WrestleMania. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. I can't believe I forgot to go back to story number four, the Raw after WrestleMania. Here's where WWE did screw up. Uh, that main event was re is so stupid. I mean, here's the issue. The, the bar versus Seth Rollins and Kofi Kingston was actually a really good match. If you had just set that match up, people wouldn't have been so excited about it. But if you had just set that match up and delivered, everything would have been fine. Kind of like what you did on SmackDown, where we knew we were getting the six-man tag to end the night. That's what you have to do. The bar versus Kofi and Seth Rollins is so much less of a match than Seth Rollins versus Kofi Kingston winner take all. It's hard to, they're not even on the same spectrum. And the idea that Kofi and Seth want each other's championships, but not badly enough to actually finish that match. If I'm Kofi and Seth goes, you know, let's save this for another time. Bar, let's do a tag team match right now. I'm going, whoa, 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 whoa. Pump the brakes on Beast Slayer, okay? I don't know. I know you want to burn down this main event, but it's not going to happen. The reason I asked for this match wasn't just because it would be fun for me and you to, to wrestle around in the ring for a while. The reason that I asked for this match is because I want the Universal Championship. And if you and I are teaming up to square off against the bar, I don't see how I'm getting the Universal Championship. So I get where you'd want to do a tag match, but eh, eh, it's not going to happen. Now let's continue this match so I can get your Universal Championship. You know, that makes sense to me. So on, on many, many levels, uh, changing the match mid-match to the bar versus Kofi and Seth made absolutely no sense whatsoever. They were just asking for the fans to rebel against it. And I don't think there's anything that the bar, Seth Rollins, or Kofi Kingston could have done uh, to make that more successful because, you know, it was my favorite bar match. If you were just watching the match, because that's what I had to start doing, instead of just questioning why is this even happening, I just had to start watching the match and going like, you know what? It's probably my favorite match that the bar has had in a long time. This is a great match. I just wish that it hadn't been set up that way. Okay, back to these injuries, and that's story number three. Um, I don't think the New Day should be separated, and I like the idea of Big E still being able to come out on TV and do his thing. The other injury that we're apparently getting, apparently uh, Nia Jax has been uh, trying to work through an injury for a while and just got it checked out, and she needs some kind of surgery and from what I'm reading, could be out for like nine months, which is a shame, but it could be okay. You know, I think if Nia Jax is out of sight, out of mind for a little while, and then Nia and Tamina just show up nine months from now and do a run in and demand that the tag team champions, the women's tag team champions, take them seriously, I don't think that that's such a bad thing. You know, I don't, I, as long as they're on TV and not champions, they're not as dominant as they could be. If they're not on TV and not champions, well, who knows who, where they would be if they were actually on TV. So the idea that they'll be off TV is actually, theoretically, hypothetically, not so bad for Tamina and Nia. You know, I, I think that it could, you could rope that in to a net positive. And that's what I hope. I hope that that's what's going on in Nia Jax's head right now, that she's already thinking about how she's going to burst back onto the scene because Nia Jax is a uh, hell of a performer. Hell of a performer, that lady. Let's go to story number two. Story number two, another rumor, but this one's a pretty heavy rumor. Apparently they're saying that uh, at, the, at the upfronts where the TV stations come together and they present their lineup to potential advertisers to try to gain some income, to try to get some money, to try to get advertisers to invest in these TV stations and throw their commercials on it. Uh, apparently, AE Dub is going to be part of the Turner uh, presentation. And uh, this could be the announcement of AE Dub showing up on either TBS or TNT. If it shows up on TBS, I hope they can work TBS into letting them start at 05. Whatever 05. Because that's when TBS was at its strongest. 605, Saturday nights. WCW Saturday night. That was my jam. 
Yeah, I love the idea of starting at 6.05. But uh, TBS, you know, here's the only thing. TBS is a legacy wrestling channel. So it's cool in that perspective. But, you know, if the issue with becoming competition to WWE is the immediate comparisons that you're going to have to WCW. Uh, and I think that going on WCW's former network is not exactly going to shy away those comparisons. Now, if a war is beginning between two promotions and one of them is WWE, I think WCW is the last thing that you want to get compared to uh, because we all know that WCW had a hell of an 83 weeks. The 83 weeks was so good, there's a podcast named after it. But beyond those 83 weeks, the company uh, completely uh, bombed, went out of business, goodbye. And WWE continue to prosper in ways that no other wrestling company in the history of the world uh, has has prospered. So, you know, I don't think that AE Dub wants to be compared to WCW. Also, WCW is not exactly known for uh, embracing and creating its own stars. All the stars that were created by WCW never end up really achieving their potential, save for Goldberg, Sting. DDP. You might be able to argue Ric Flair too, but then you get into Dusty Rhodes and the NWA, and I don't think that that's fair. I think that by the time WCW was an established organization, Ric Flair was already a star from his years of wrestling for the NWA. So I think really the only WCW created stars that I can think of were, yeah, were, were, were DDP, Sting, and Goldberg. You might be able to throw Booker T into that mix. Uh, but I don't know if you can credit WCW for that one, honestly. You know, I think that uh, Booker T probably became the biggest star that he ever was in WWE. And all these stars that came over to WWE after WCW, WWE recreates them. Like, WWE doesn't kind of go off of their reputation previously. Look at all the stars that were, you know, they were in TNA. But they go to WWE, they become superstars. You don't think about AJ Styles in TNA. You don't think about Samoa Joe in TNA. You don't think about any of these people. Bobby Roode even. You don't think about his TNA run anymore because you think about what they're doing in WWE. And that's the way it's supposed to be. There was never a point in WCW when Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, uh, you know, any of these people. There was never a time when you weren't thinking about what they did in WWE, you just weren't. I mean, the, the WWE part of their history was what made them stars and what allowed them to be stars. Um, you know, you could bring up examples like Eddie Guerrero. You could bring up examples like uh, Rey Mysterio. You could bring up Chris Benoit. You could bring up uh, uh, any of those guys. But realistically speaking, they were all big stars in WWE. They weren't ever the stars in WCW that they were in WWE. Even close, you know. Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio had one of the greatest matches in WCW history at Halloween Havoc to the point where we're still talking about it. But those guys weren't anywhere near the main event of WCW. They came to WWE, they both became world champions. That's the difference. Um, and I don't think AEW is going to do what WCW did in that respect. You know, I think AEW, when you look at it, you know, I, I think that Cody Rhodes will be a much bigger star in AEW than he ever was in WWE. Uh, I think that, you know, he was not, not nowhere near the main event and he will be in AEW. You got guys like Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks and uh, all those guys who have never, never even stepped foot in WWE. And then when you talk about Chris Jericho, Chris Jericho has done a tremendous job of kind of creating his own lane. The WWE stuff he did was important and always will be important, and I don't think he gets to where he's at today without the WWE stuff. But Chris Jericho is one of the very few in the world of sports entertainment that when you look at Jericho, you look at a guy who is, you don't think of WWE necessarily, you just think of Jericho. Jericho has gotten to a place where you think of, you you know, because he, 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 he's got WCW, he's got his tremendous several WWE runs, but then he's got his band. He's got his acting stuff. He's got everything he did for New Japan. The last two years or so of work that he did. 
you know, reinventing himself. And that's the thing. This version of Chris Jericho that we're getting right now has never been in WWE. And I think that that's important. And I think that that's what AEW has to continue to do in order to be dominant. You know, I've seen, I saw online, people were arguing about whether or not AEW is the second biggest promotion in the world right now. And I am on team absolutely not. You know, I, I don't understand people who already consider themselves AEW fans. I don't understand people who are already loyal to AEW. AEW has not done a show. AEW has done two press conferences and they have a website. You know, they've got t-shirts, they got two press conferences and that's it. The t-shirts are incredibly successful. The press conferences were incredibly successful. But I don't even take all in and say that was an AEW show. It wasn't. And by the way, AEW is really good at selling tickets. 100% of their tickets that have gone on sale have sold out incredibly fast. But it's one show, you know? I think that, that what's important here is that the TV is going to prove it. AEW has the potential to be the second biggest company in the world of wrestling. And I think that that is very likely to happen, at least for a period of time, right? You know, I don't see any other company coming anywhere near it. So, but I think that the thing is that it's not going to happen without TV. And once this TV comes, that's when you got to look at it and say, okay, well, if I can get these stars every week and if I can see these matches every week, the TV now has to hook me to buy pay-per-views every quarter or whatever. This is not the type of thing where every show is going to be a magical show, right? All In felt like it was once in a lifetime. Double or Nothing feels like it's like, oh, this special magical show. It's the first AEW thing. But realistically, when AEW is going to when you look at it and go like, okay, this promotion is going to be around for many, many years. I don't have to go to this show. I'll go to the next one. Then, then what happens? And that's what I'm waiting to see. I'm not being negative about it. I think they could be extremely successful. The roster that they have, uh, the finance that they have behind it and the brains that they have invested in it, I'm good with it. But I also think it's too early to sit here and make any proclamations about it being successful or not, by the way. The people who are going like, well, AEW has no chance, also wrong. Well, let's not sit here saying that it's like AEW is an amazing promotion because they haven't done anything. But let's not sit here and say AEW is bound to fail because they haven't done anything. How would you know? They've got all the ingredients. And I'm, uh, I'll am i be tuning into the TV show, that's for sure. Story number one is the Superstar Shakeup. Superstar Shakeup is going down this Monday and Tuesday. Uh, I love the Superstar Shakeup. Uh, I think it freshens everything up. And I really quickly put together uh, a couple of lists. Uh, I have a few call-ups, but not a ton. Maybe I'll add a couple right now. Um, you know what? I'm going to add two more. Okay. And okay. And these are just based on uh, what happened at TakeOver. Okay, so... Here's how I'm thinking I would shake things up. I looked at it from in two perspectives. Number one, moving people from one brand to another brand, whether that's from NXT to Raw or SmackDown, from SmackDown to Raw, from Raw to SmackDown, or from the UK to whatever. Taking people who are on one brand and putting them on either Raw or SmackDown. Number two, I looked at the people who are on every brand right now. I looked at, I mean, you've got everybody who was called up recently has no home, technically. And I think that this superstar shakeup is when we have to define that. So I'm talking Lacey Evans. I'm talking EC3. I'm talking Lars Sullivan. I'm talking Heavy Machinery. I'm talking Ricochet. I'm talking Aleister Black. Those guys need to find homes. I'm also talking about Charlotte and Becky's the only uh, exception. I'll tell you why. But I'm talking about Charlotte too. If you look at the uh, program for WrestleMania... Charlotte is kind of in between brands and she has been leading up to WrestleMania. I think we need to clearly define at the Superstar Shakeup which brand Charlotte is on. Um, Becky is the only one who I wouldn't define which brand they're on because she's got both titles. And that's a big difference. It's She doesn't have a unified title that the title can belong to a brand. She's got both titles, which means she should be responsible to both brands. I mean, Honestly, I don't think she should be wrestling uh, twice on pay-per-views. But I'm not opposed to somebody on to having different rivalries on Raw and SmackDown. 
I'm not opposed to somebody on SmackDown going after the, after the SmackDown title and somebody on Raw going after the Raw title, which means if she goes to, say, Money in the Bank and has to deal with Lacey Evans getting the Raw title, she knows in the back of her head that somewhere, Naomi, let's say, is looking has made it clear that she's looking for the SmackDown title. I think she should have one match on every pay-per-view, but she should be on Raw and SmackDown. And there should be two rivalries for Becky Lynch going on at the same time. That's the way I would play it. If you're going to keep the title separate, and I like the idea that you are. So let's go over the superstar shakeup and uh, who I would put where. Uh, I'm going to go over my Raw roster first. Here's who I have coming over to Raw. Okay? I have Ricochet and Aleister Black cemented on Raw. Ricochet and Aleister Black, I would keep them as a team for now. And I would keep them on Monday Night Raw. I would keep Lars Sullivan on Monday Night Raw. He stays on Monday Night Raw. Um, And I would keep Heavy Machinery on Monday Night Raw. Those guys are staying on Raw. They're cemented for Monday Night Raw. I would move Charlotte over to Raw full-time. I think that at this point, there's not that much else for Charlotte to do on SmackDown. Um... And I think that uh, she needs to remind everybody who watches on Monday nights what a big star she is. She's done a tremendous job leading up to WrestleMania. I think Raw is the place for her post-Superstar shakeup. Along those same lines, I would put AJ Styles on Monday Night Raw. AJ Styles has done everything you can possibly do on SmackDown. It feels like he's playing the hits in his matches now. Um, he's just not, you've heard me talk about AJ Styles on the podcast before. He's not the same AJ. We're not talking about him in conversations for the main event on SmackDown anymore. So let's move him over. And I wouldn't be so against having AJ Styles as a heel. I kind of love the idea of AJ Styles showing up at the end of the superstar shakeup and jumping Seth Rollins. You know, I love the idea of going forward with a heel AJ Styles and a good guy Seth Rollins going forward. I love that as a match. So I would bring AJ Styles to Raw. I would make him a bad guy. I would have him go after Seth Rollins right away. And then maybe eventually Finn Balor goes to uh, AJ Styles. He goes, what are you doing, man? Then we get into a Finn Balor, AJ Styles rivalry. I love it. Um, I would move uh, Daniel Bryan over to Raw. You know, I think that this Daniel Bryan character right now is great. I think that hypothetically... AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan could be the two top bad guys on Monday Night Raw. Of course, that means Rowan is coming with him. I would keep Rowan with him, and I would move Rowan and Daniel Bryan over to Raw. Daniel Bryan has been on SmackDown the entire time that he's been back in WWE. I think that he needs to come to Raw because I think he also... I love the idea of AJ Styles as a bad guy versus Seth Rollins. I love the idea of Daniel Bryan versus Seth Rollins, going after that universal title. I think that it's a big deal making Seth Rollins the universal champion in the sense that we can have universal title matches every single pay-per-view. We can have the universal champion represented on every single Raw. Now what we need is compelling opponents for that universal champion, and I think Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles are those compelling opponents for Seth Rollins on Monday Night Raw. I would move, speaking of champions, the Iconics over to Monday Night Raw. The Iconics coming over to Monday Night Raw. I think uh, then we could really get the Sasha Bailey Iconics rivalry heated up. You know, I think that the Iconics impressed a lot of people on at WrestleMania. I think it opened a lot of people's eyes to who the Iconics are. I still think that they're horrible human beings, and that was evident if you watch the watch along. They're bad winners. Um, they're poor sports. They're full of themselves. But I think that Monday nights people should be able to see them. So I would put the Iconics on Monday Night Raw. I would also put Andrade with Zelina Vega on Monday Night Raw. He's doing nothing on SmackDown. He's a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous talent. Um, I think the world of him as a wrestler. And uh, I could see him. I would. I like the idea of him going after the Intercontinental title, actually. I love the idea of seeing, uh, you know, AJ Styles going after Seth Rollins. Andrade going after Finn Balor, maybe. If Daniel Bryan's not going after Finn Balor, maybe Andrade is going after Finn Balor. You know, Daniel Bryan is maybe going. How about this? How about if Monday Night Raw has AJ Styles versus Seth Rollins, then right under that, Daniel Bryan versus Roman Reigns, then right under that, Andrade versus Finn Balor. To me, that's a hell of a shakeup. Not to mention, 
You've got uh, Lars Sullivan in the mix. You got Ricochet and Alistair Black trying to get those tag titles. You've also, in the Raw Women's Division, got Asuka. Asuka moves over to Raw to kind of try to rebuild everything that Asuka was. I love the idea of Asuka leaving SmackDown. Nothing good has happened for her on SmackDown. She's a shell of the goddess of tomorrow that she once was, or the empress of tomorrow. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's just, I mean, it's been, it's been a garbage time for her on SmackDown. So move her over to Raw and hopefully she'll be able to get something done. I would put Mandy on Raw. I would separate Mandy and Sonya Deville, keep Sonya Deville over on SmackDown, move Mandy to Raw. I think that Mandy is electric. I think she's an incredible personality. I think she's got all the potential in the world. But if you had Asuka and Mandy and, and, and the Iconics and they're all on Raw and Asuka, you got the Iconics who are uh, being chased by Becky and Sasha. You've got Asuka and Mandy both chasing Becky. I think a whole bunch of great stuff could happen. I would remove Rey Mysterio over to Raw just because, you know, who knows how much longer Rey Mysterio has. He's been beaten by everybody on SmackDown, so why not give everybody on Raw a chance to beat him too? Uh, and uh, I, would have, I would shock the world by bringing the United States Championship over to Monday Night Raw and have Samoa Joe on Raw. Now, this might mean he has to lose the title uh, in short order. This It could mean a lot of things because I'm not moving Finn Balor to SmackDown. I'm having Samoa Joe and Finn Balor both on Raw. And just to mix things up, I'm bringing the U.S. title over to Raw. And then I'm going to figure out later how I'm going to get it back to SmackDown or bring the Intercontinental title to SmackDown. And in terms of NXT call-ups, I'm bringing Pete Dunne over to Raw. He just lost the UK championship. You know, unless the plan is for... It's like once you hold the UK championship for as long as he had it, you know, I'd love to see another Pete Dunne-Walter match, but the best case scenario is that he wins back the UK title and you it almost feels exhausting, the idea of him having another run with that championship. So in the meantime, let that championship go into the wild and let's see what Pete Dunne can do on Raw. And I would bring the Undisputed Era to Monday Night Raw. All four members to Monday Night Raw. And I would have them just, uh, I would have them mix things up on Raw. You know, maybe start backstage, maybe uh, messing with people. You know, I love the idea of the, of, you know, the Undisputed Era. Maybe you build up some great good guy versus good guy match. Maybe you have uh, the Undisputed Era come out and attack Ricochet and Aleister Black because they don't like that the, of all the NXT call-ups, Ricochet and Aleister Black are getting all the shine, you know, but I would bring the entire Undisputed Era over to Raw. And that's really because Adam Cole had his chance at the NXT Championship. He lost. So let's do something else. That's my Raw roster. I mean, that's my Raw shakeup. Ricochet, Aleister Black, Charlotte, Heavy Machinery, AJ Styles, The Iconics, Andrade, Asuka, Daniel Bryan with Eric Rowan, Lars Sullivan, Mandy, Rey Mysterio, Samoa Joe, Undisputed Era, all four, and Pete Dunne. SmackDown. SmackDown is big, too. I'm also bringing people from NXT to SmackDown. I'm bringing Io Shirai and Kaidi Sane over to SmackDown. Eventually, they're going to go after those women's tag team championships. But, you know, I really think that the main roster needs to build women's tag teams. And I don't think that there are any women's tag teams that are better than Kaidi Sane and Io Shirai. So I bring Kaidi Sane and Io Shirai to SmackDown uh, just because I think they'd be great. And I think they do women's tag matches that weren't necessarily for the title and encourage the Iconics to come on over to SmackDown and give us a shot. I would move uh, Drew McIntyre to SmackDown. I thought it was really cool seeing him on SmackDown. He lost to Roman Reigns at WrestleMania, which it is a loss, but at the same time, I think raises his stock still. Um, and I think that, that he could be the number one bad guy on SmackDown. I like the idea of Drew McIntyre going after Kofi Kingston, for example. Now that Kofi Kingston is champion, he's got to deal with Drew McIntyre. I think that that's great. I would put Lacey Evans actually on SmackDown. I think Lacey is, you know, she's made a name for herself. I love the attacks on Becky Lynch, but I would put her on SmackDown so that over on Raw, Becky's got Charlotte and Mandy and Asuka to worry about. And over on SmackDown, she's got Lacey and Kaidi and EO and 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 everybody and Naomi and and everybody on SmackDown to worry about. You know, I like I like that idea. I would put EC3 on SmackDown just because I think on Raw, we're so used to seeing him not even compete on Raw, let alone win. 
that on SmackDown it might feel a little bit fresher. I know he's had appearances on SmackDown, but I feel like he's had more appearances on Raw. That's at least how it feels to me. So I put EC3 on SmackDown and immediately make him a bad guy and kind of try to hype that up a little bit. Uh, I would bring Bobby Lashley over to SmackDown with Leo. I think that uh, Bobby Lashley has done what he's going to do over on Raw. I don't think that there's any room for him to grow over there. And I think that uh, on SmackDown, he could be a champion. You know, he could, again, that's another threat. I wouldn't mind seeing Bobby Lashley versus Kofi Kingston headlining a pay-per-view. I think that would be really cool. I would have Sami Zayn on SmackDown just because uh, I like the idea of Kevin Owens sitting on SmackDown and having Sami versus Kevin. This time, Sami is the bad guy and Kevin Owens is the good guy. I think that that would be cool. Baron Corbin, I would move him to SmackDown. I think uh, a lot of damage was done to him on Raw when uh, Kurt Angle came in and took him out. I don't think that was necessary. You know, it took away a lot of what happened at WrestleMania. So let's distance ourselves from that. I think that he's gotten a little bit stale over on Raw. And I think that he could come to SmackDown, maybe lose the GM getup, bring back some wrestling tights, and uh, do some damage. I would bring the Revival over to SmackDown, really just because I want a Revival versus Usos tag team title run. How great would that be? Ember Moon I would bring over to SmackDown, just because she hasn't really done anything on Raw, and it's time. Uh, I would bring Jinder Mahal back to SmackDown, just because on Raw, I don't think that you can remind people that Jinder Mahal was a champion because everybody's like, yeah, right. But on SmackDown, it happened on SmackDown. So I would put Jinder back on SmackDown. I wouldn't necessarily make him a main eventer, but I would put him on SmackDown. Uh, I would bring Nikki Cross over to SmackDown, hopefully maybe inject some life into Sanity. I would do something with Sanity and I would put Nikki Cross in with them because I think if Sanity, Sanity is one of the few groups that could run roughshod over the men's and the women's division. I think that that's a cool little thing. And, uh, uh, Post-injury, I would bring Nia and Tamina over to SmackDown just because I really want to see Nia and Tamina versus Kaidi and Io. I think that that would be great. So over on SmackDown, I've got Kaidi and Io, as I just said. i got Drew McIntyre. I've got Lacey. I've got EC3. i got Bobby Lashley, Sami Zayn, Baron Corbin, The Revival, Ember Moon, Jinder Mahal, Nia Jackson, Tamina, and Nikki Cross all going to SmackDown. That's the way I would break up the Superstar Shakeup. Let me know what you think... Uh, I'm always anxious to hear. I love stuff like this because this is the stuff that you can actually play with and have your little fantasy bookings and it's not too uh, outside the realm of possibly actually happening. I'm going to be tuned in. It's going to get interesting. I can't wait. Thank you for tuning in to this week's Not Sam Wrestling. We will see you again uh, very soon. This time, hopefully, not late. Goodbye, everybody. Uh, It's been real. Thanks for listening. Follow at NotSam on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Rate, review, and subscribe. This has been Not Sam Wrestling. Not Sam Wrestling.